One, a 30-year-old woman was hired to work at the reception at my job in Germany a month ago, and it's not going well. Although she is a university student and previously finished a traineeship in foreign language communication, she does not understand English. It's an international company, and she promised in her interview that she speaks it. Yet every time someone comes down to ask a question, she looks at me afterwards and asks what they said. Sometimes during a conversation with someone, she will just switch to German with me, excluding the English-speaking person completely. She thinks five men in the office are in love with her. For one, asking her about her plans for the weekend; two, asking if he can use our printer; three, sending a private message to her on our internal chat, asking for help with something; four, writing a comment on a ticket at 10 p.m., even though it's 100% work-related; and five, sending her a long explanation after she asks someone a question. She keeps saying she can sense it in their body language. Even though I can see the conversation, and she barely responds to the questions, and is pretty rude. She spent five hours of her first day trying to log in without her password. Begging her to please go to IT and get a new one in a second was to no avail. She kept saying it's very strange not being able to log in without a password. After the IT guy helped her create a new password, he is of course also in love with her. Because he was overly friendly, she forgot it again. She had gotten a backup code to reset the password that we had told her to please save. Screenshot, write down in your phone, save in a Word doc or whatever. She just insisted that nobody ever told me anything about a code. After nine hours in the office, she does not go home. She stays for coffee, tea, or starts eating when everyone else leaves. Pretty sad. After being late every single day the first two weeks, sometimes an hour, she went to a medium on an app and said she can sense that someone at work doesn't like her and asked if it's our boss. He said yes, and she was very impressed that he knew this information. She thinks she has a special power to sense what others think and feel because a medium in an app told her so. Once she ran into the back office where I was. And asked me to come to the front where there was a delivery guy. I got to the reception, and the guy looks exhausted, and just laughs and says he needs a name and a signature so he can finally leave. I give him my name and sign, and she goes, "I was so confused. I didn't understand what he wanted. He was speaking her mother tongue. Does she not know what is your name in her mother tongue?" Let me be clear that the issue was not that she was unsure if she's allowed to sign. She said several times that she did not understand what he wanted. Two, trigger warning: mention of mild dog attack and blood. I have two stories. One happened in the late 2000s, and the other happened this spring. I'll give you some background first. So Kevin is an old friend of my dad's. He, his daughter, and various family members would come camp in our fishing landing once or twice a year. They would stay between two and five days to hang out and fish. I usually spent a couple of nights in the landing with them. Kevin is an alcoholic who gets shit-faced often. He is also a huge sweetheart. He'd give you the shirt off his back. You probably wouldn't want it though, due to it being covered in beer and/or vomit. I've known him since I was a baby, and I've never seen him fully sober. Because he was a good friend and always respectful of our land, my dad let him come back every year. I've allowed him to come fish a couple of years since my dad has passed, but he always had his daughter with him, who's about 17 now. The last time he came without her because she was sick. I will not allow him back without a responsible sober person with him. One year, Kevin got insanely drunk and decided to go for a Darwin Award. Unfortunately, I was not in the landing at the time. This was relayed to my parents and I in the morning. After everyone else had gone to sleep, Kevin was still up night fishing, which wasn't unusual. He decided to clean and gut his fish by firelight. This isn't even where it gets bad. He actually managed to do that with few cuts to his hands. To not lose his knife, he decided to throw it into the ground at the base of a tree. He missed. It went through his foot. 
He then stumbled far enough back to roll down the bank into the river. It's a small river with a weak current, and the bank is only about seven feet high. He floated down the river a little bit and got out in between my landing and the public one. After limping back to the landing and wrapping his foot in a towel, he had another brilliant idea. He was going to pull the truck around so it would be easier to leave in the morning. That did not go as planned. Remember the tree he tried to throw the knife near? Yeah, he crashed into it. He was only a couple of feet away from the tree to begin with, so the airbags didn't even go off. We were told part of the story in the morning when he came limping up the driveway to get a ride to the urgent care. We were told the rest once he got back and was mostly okay. The truck was drivable. Here comes the not-so-fun story. Background. We got our pity Belle in 2012. She's a sweet girl, mostly licks and grunts, but very few bites. She's only bitten me, and other than this, it wasn't aggressive. After my dad passed, she got separation anxiety and would freak out when I got on the school bus. She would bite at my clothes to pull me back to the house, and sometimes she nipped through the clothes and my skin. Belle hates most other dogs. She's only ever liked the neighbors, neutered pities. Kevin is fully aware of this, as is his daughter. She has a chihuahua whom my dog hates. Belle doesn't consider the landing her territory, so other dogs are completely safe down there. She will, however, chase out or fight any animal in the yard except the neighbor's dogs. She will try to kill anything that gets onto the porch. This year, Kevin, Kevin Jr., and the Chihuahua Sadie came to stay for the weekend. The first day, I reminded both of them that they couldn't let Sadie out of the truck while they were up at the house. This has been the rule for 11 years, and we've never had an incident before. The next day, they let her out of the truck when they came to say goodbye, when they knocked at the door to the porch, I opened it all the way, thinking Sadie was in the truck. Belle went straight for her. I did what you're not supposed to do. I dived down and grabbed Sadie, putting myself between her and Belle. Belle got Sadie on the butt and sighed, but she didn't break the skin. I wasn't quite as lucky. I ended up with a third lip piercing and a solid bite in my forearm. I texted Kevin's daughter to let her know what happened and that Sadie was okay. If he wants to come back this year, it's either with his daughter or without the dog. I'm not good with endings, but that was the stupid, most reckless shit that Kevin's done in my property. 3. Context. My old roommate was dumb as a brick. He moved from New York City and had never driven a day in his life. He was mid-thirties with a master's degree from Yale, but he had zero life skills because he went from being coddled endlessly by mommy, who moved closer to his school so she could cook every meal for him and do all his laundry, cleaning, etc. for him, to being married to a new mommy of a wife, who left when she got tired of taking care of him. His mom gave him her car so he could move out here, Colorado and got to work at his very prestigious high-earning sales job. In the six months he lived with us, he caused seven different accidents and went through five different cars in the process. One was a hit and run of a car one block away from our house. He tried to lie, but slipped, and we told the neighbor because he was trying to tell us the neighbor said it was fine, and we didn't believe him. So in asking the neighbor, who was a friend, to confirm, we unintentionally sold him out. He only ate gummy candy and Fiber One bars for meals, and he ruined almost everything he touched because he just didn't know how to use it. He also followed us around everywhere we went like a stray cat and would ask us things like, How fast do you think these skis go? Or, Do I need to put laundry detergent in the dryer too? All my dishes are dirty, what do I do? all while rubbing his prestigious degree in our faces. He got a Tinder date and invited her over to cook for her. I don't know why he would do that because he didn't even know how to turn the stove on, let alone how to prepare food. He ended up cutting his fingertip off at the knuckle, cutting potatoes. 
He couldn't get to the emergency room as neither he nor his dad had cars at the time, and we were all out doing other things. He forgot 911 or Uber were things and tried to walk there instead. But he didn't Google the address, so his plan was to just start walking and hope he ended up at a hospital. He bled out all over the kitchen and floors and carpet, and he didn't even bother to act like he was going to clean it up. He just asked if we were going to clean it up soon because it was gross to look at. Also, he wandered to the emergency room without the fingertip, and he seriously asked if they could still make it look like it looked before. He told us the doctor got mad at him for asking, and he didn't understand why. Like, sure, buddy, they just have a drawer full of fingertips. Go pick the one that matches best. Frankly, I'm mostly just shocked he even got there at all. We didn't live anywhere near a hospital. The closest one was like seven miles away. We as a household were throwing a Super Bowl party for like 20-ish people. We had a big living room and just installed a large projector, so we were the spot for fights and games. We were all contributing something and it was a potluck, so everyone brought something even if it was just utensils or soda. He said he'd help me make the mozzarella sticks I was planning to make. I thought that was weird, but let him. We both stood with the trash can at one hip with the counter between us. He kept peeling open the string cheese and handing me the plastic, despite being closer to the trash than he was to me. When I asked what he was contributing, he said he didn't want to spend money. We asked if he could walk across the street to the liquor store on the opposite corner for a single bag of ice, and he said it was too far. It was directly across the street from our backyard. You could wave at the cashier. We told him he wasn't allowed to eat any of the food or drink any drinks if he didn't contribute this time. Anytime my other roommate caught him grabbing food, he would take the plate and say, Thanks for making me a plate. That was so nice of you. He even took the fork out of his hand at one point, as it was on its way to his mouth. This happened seven or eight times before he figured it out. He insisted that he come grocery shopping or run errands with us. But he would follow us silently with his hood pulled up and wouldn't engage with us until we got back to the car. My roommate's car was a two-door, so you have to let the person in the back out. He would just get out of the front and close the door and walk away oblivious, leaving you stuck. He tried to make a steak once by turning on the stove and putting a teeny cast iron pan I think something that fits maybe three eggs, on full heat, on one of the largest burners, with no oil or butter or anything. Then he dropped a giant steak into it, sees it overflow onto the stove top like a pie crust you haven't trimmed yet. Then he just walked away to watch soccer in his room. I came home to a completely black, smoke-filled kitchen, and a seriously messed up glass burner with steak burnt onto it. Turns out he disabled the smoke detectors because they were too loud, and he was just staring at his steak burning, fusing to the pan and burner. He looked up at me, and he just kind of shrugged and goes, I don't understand why it's so smoky, I disabled the smoke alarms. This man really thought that the alarms were what caused the smoke to be so bad. I cannot stand that this person exists in the world, Remembering him raised my blood pressure. I will never understand how he goes from blithering idiot to polished high-earning salesman making 200,000 every day on his way to work. He's two completely different people. Thanks for making it through my rant. This was kind of cathartic to write out. 4. I'm a 24-year-old woman, and my friend is a 25-year-old woman. When she started dating again after a devastating breakup, I was pretty stunned. My first impression was that this new guy, 25, could not be any more different from her ex-boyfriend. Her ex was well put together, formal, and a law student, and while I wasn't the biggest fan of him as her partner, he was always very polite and mild-mannered. On the first day I met her new boyfriend, he swung open my apartment door without knocking, and loudly announced that the lobby of my building had free cookies placing a plate of cookies onto my kitchen counter. I was a little shocked as the lobby usually had a plate with about 10 cookies for people to take one, and this dude took the entire thing. 
The next thing I noticed was his appearance, standing at 6'4 and probably weighing 140 pounds. He is easily the lankiest person I've ever laid eyes on. He was wearing an extremely oversized shirt, a ball cap on backwards, and had cookie crumbs all over his face. My friend walked in behind him, looking a little embarrassed as I welcomed them in. The rest of the night became an endless cycle of me giving him the benefit of the doubt, and him proving me wrong. That night we played some board games, and although extremely enthusiastic about every game we played, I can only describe his ability to actually play as... incompetent. When he couldn't keep up with my original choices, I gave up trying to explain and chose an easy one, Pictionary. Every time it was his turn to draw, he would toss away the ones he didn't know, find one he did, ask my friend to whisper in his ear what he should draw, and fervently scribbled while yelling, Tell me when you need a hint! And then giving the hint the next second. And the hints were like, it rhymes with lelephant. Every time it was his turn to guess, he would leap from the couch, bouncing around the room and shouting random words, while clapping his hands excitedly. I would soon come to learn that this was Kevin. He was constantly, and at times offensively, enthusiastic, clumsy, and downright stupid. As much as I struggled to spend an hour with the guy, I didn't understand why my friend was dating him. I could tell she loved him, and he always treated her well, so I'd have to accept that this guy was going to be at a lot of events I was at. Needless to say, once Kevin entered the picture, there hasn't been a dull moment. I'd like to share a couple of my favorite stories about him. He found a nest of baby birds and brought them inside, nest and all, because he didn't see any birds around to mother them. My friend's mother mentioned to him that he was welcome to come to church with them over Christmas, and his response was, Isn't it closed? Then, sad mother decided to see just how far this went. She asked him, You know who's born on Christmas, don't you? Kevin's response, The Grinch! In the middle of the night, he awoke to a commotion outside, and walked out the door in his underwear to investigate. He saw a man standing next to his car. This strange man casually convinced him that he was his next door neighbor. Kevin knows both of his neighbors. Just checking his tires. Kevin chatted for a while and went back to sleep while the neighbor looted everything in his car. For his birthday, he asked my friend to take him to the Super Mario movie. My friend said he laughed harder than any kid there and ate so much popcorn and candy that he puked when they got home. And here's my all-time favorite. Kevin was invited to my uncle's funeral. As my friend was coming and I told her he could come along, though apprehensive about this. When Kevin showed up, I was confused. He was wearing a suit that was way too short and too tight. I giggled and asked when he'd last worn it. He explained that he'd never worn it, never owned a suit found it at the train station recently, and could not believe his luck. He went around to all my older relatives, asking them to guess where he got his suit, then would proudly announce that he found it under a bench. During the funeral proceedings, I heard his loud wailing from behind me. I didn't mind at all, as many were crying, but this was wailing. I turned around, and there's Kevin, sobbing his eyes out while my friend comforts him. After the funeral, I gave him a big hug, crying a bit myself. After the funeral, I realized that he wasn't so bad. That I'd grown to feel disappointed at events that Kevin wasn't at. Because he never failed to add a little bit of chaos and a little bit of joy. He proposed to my friend over the summer. I honestly cannot wait to see them get married and be a bridesmaid for the first time. I really hope he wears the suit he found. 5. My own Kevin went to high school with me. We only ever had two classes together, sophomore year history and PE. I didn't interact with him that much personally, and don't actually remember if he graduated with us or what. I could check the yearbook, but I'm lazy. Anyway, this guy was... an interesting person. Let's start with history. The history teacher, Mr. Santos, was a super chill guy and we spent a lot of class playing this history trivia game. 
To be fair, a wrong answer was punished less harshly than no answer. So some people said whatever came to their head, even knowing it was stupid. But some of Kevin's answers really took the cake. For example, the country with the highest number of Catholics is California. Kevin didn't seem to know the difference between country, state, or a continent. The most commonly spoken language in Africa is Japanese. The official language of Cuba is Cubism. Abraham Lincoln was shot by Barack Obama. World War II began in the year 2000. The most profitable American cash crop in the 1800s was hot dogs. On top of giving stupid answers, Kevin loved to ask stupid questions. He would often raise his hand in the middle of class and ask something completely off topic, often about the teacher's personal life or something offensive. Many of Kevin's classmates appreciated Kevin's ability to waste class time. However, I am not convinced that this was strategic on Kevin's part. Here are some of his best questions. If you have sex with your girlfriend and she's pregnant, and your thingy pokes the baby, is that child abuse? In regards to the Great Recession, which was going on at that time, why can't the president just make more money? What would happen if you tried to sue a dead person? This one actually succeeded in getting the teacher to explain the concept of suing an estate for 20 minutes. Shortly before the final, If someone dies, do we all get an A? During a video about Pearl Harbor survivors. Wait, they have cars in Hawaii? How did they get there? Then to the teacher, You have a wife? Is she hot? Also to the teacher, Hey, you know Mrs. White, the English teacher, right? Be honest, would you hit that? Some other Kevin moments from history class. I have no idea how this topic came up, but at one point, Kevin was arguing that men could survive if all women died off, but not vice versa. His reasoning was, men do all the building and women just do all the cooking and cleaning and stuff. A girl who apparently knew Kevin's family said, Kevin, isn't your mom a construction worker? His reply was, Oh, yeah. We had an assignment to create our own totalitarian nation in North America. We had to come up with the rules, the fictional timeline, resource map, and propaganda poster then give a presentation of our fictional nation. Kevin's presentation was reading what seemed to be a word-for-word -word printout of the Wikipedia article on the United States. The other class I had with Kevin was P.E. You would think that P.E. would leave Kevin with fewer opportunities to be obviously stupid, however, this is not so. The P.E. teacher, Coach Ingram, was an older southern black lady, however not the nice grandma type. She was an ex-military and ran PE class like boot camp. Or at least, how my bratty teenage self imagined boot camp. In hindsight, I really respect Coach Ingram. She pushed us hard, but it was clearly for our own good. She once gave us a speech about how we shouldn't take our education for granted. Because if we could find a way to make a living that didn't involve some of the stuff she'd seen, we were very fortunate. A lot of students at my school were low income and she genuinely wanted us to do well for ourselves. However, at the time I was a total brat who thought Coach Ingram was a mean hard ass because she wouldn't let me get away with weaponizing incompetence to avoid doing any actual exercise in her class. So much for my strategy of striking out on purpose at baseball. She made me keep trying until I actually hit the thing. Anyway, I'm going off topic. But that's the kind of person Coach was. Anyway, one thing she did bring to class from boot camp is collective punishment, meaning if someone fucked up, everyone had to do push-ups, sit-ups, or burpees. Every day after taking attendance, the whole class had to do five push-ups for each student who forgot their PE uniform. Guess who forgot his PE uniform a lot? Kevin. Kevin also liked to ask Coach Ingram personal questions, Sometimes she would entertain these, and sometimes she would punish everyone for them. Every time Kevin raised his hand, the entire class sucked in a breath, cried out in protest, or crossed their fingers. It was honestly like Russian roulette. Some of these questions were, Did you vote for Obama because he's black? For context, she had never even mentioned if she voted for Obama at all. How many people did you kill? Do you believe in God? Or aliens? 
Why are most PE teachers overweight? Her response was, Are you implying something, Kevin? While standing over him and giving him a menacing gaze. Hey, hey, coach. Do you know Mr. Adams? The math teacher. Yeah, you know what he said? He said, Those that can't do, teach. Those that can't teach, teach PE. Her response, Eh, probably true. Ten burpees, everyone. And cackled wildly. Hey, coach, if I can do the soldier boy, can I not run the mile? Sure, if you want to get an F. He tried to do the soldier boy anyway, but he couldn't remember it. For the last one, I basically need to write out the whole conversation. Basically, we were in the middle of class playing street hockey and a white girl, not from our class, comes into the court, walks up to coach and says, Hey, Kathy, your lunch. To me, it immediately struck me as weird that she called her by her first name. My teenage self thinking, the fuck? Coach is an actual person with a full name and personal relationships? Mind blown. Kevin is also surprised, and before the girl even leaves, he steps away from the game, raises his hand and goes, Coach, 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 who is that? Coach decides to answer his question, and now the whole class is paying attention. She puts her hand on the white girl's shoulder, smiles, and says, This is my daughter, Delilah. When Delilah hears this, she immediately squeals and hugs the coach while jumping up and down. Like, obviously, has a huge reaction that the whole class is confused by that, and so is Coach. Coach is like, whoa, whoa, what's wrong? And Delilah's like, you call me your daughter. Now, it's super obvious to me and anyone else in the class that has at least a double-digit IQ that Delilah is adopted or something. The girls on my team are like, that was hella fucking cute. It clearly was a big heartwarming moment, even my bratty teenage self thought so. However, Kevin is still clearly confused. A few minutes after the girl leaves, the coach blows her whistle to end the class. We all line up where we're supposed to, blah blah blah. Kevin raises his hand. Coach? Yes, Kevin? You fucked a white guy? Cue a collective groan from the class. I fucked a lot of white guys. 30 push-ups, everyone. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to A Cacophony of Kevins, episode 15. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. And before you go, please do poke the like button, and share the video with friends and family. Also, to support the channel, click on the link to the Patreon in the description. It takes you right to it, you can support me for however much you like there, little as a dollar a month. Also, if you enjoyed the video and would like to leave a tip, Hit that heart with the dollar sign in the middle and select the tip of your choice. And before I forget, we have a shout out that goes to the author of story number three. That is Damn Your Logic. Thank you very much, Damn Your Logic. Okay, I don't think we have any other business today, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... This one comes from the Reddit, thanks to Newcomb. And that question is, what's the most disconnect with an older person experience with current prices that you've come across? In this case, I'm the old person because when I think about just how much prices have risen, uh, the things I used to buy on the regular in the past few years, some things have gone up a few pence, other things have doubled or more than doubled in some cases. And it's ridiculous. It gets to the point where it's just not worth it anymore. So certain things I've just stopped buying or in a few cases, not stop buying, but certainly stop buying them anywhere near as much. So, yeah, so I was the old man the whole time. But what are yours? Have you encountered an older person who has uh, had a, a less than current grip on how much things should cost? Let me know what you think in a comment below. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.